capital, lots of money has the power to shape society. Now, what if we don't want the same shape of society as Larry Fink does? And we don't even get a vote in it. And they control all these proxy votes all over the place and all these boards. So we got to make a clear decision here, I think, as a party. Are we going to live in like some corporate oligarchy? Or are we going to live in a democratic constitutional republic where we get to make the decisions at the ballot box? Obviously, I believe the latter. And I think if we don't do some of the pushback and reset that, I think it's going to be the former. Howdy, everyone. Welcome back to Moment of Truth, the podcast of American Moment. My name is Saurabh Sharma. I'm the president of American Moment, and I'm joined by Nick Solheim, the COO of American Moment. I still say that the exact same way. It's been like a bajillion episodes. Every time. Every time. Yep. Anyway. But so do you. I know. I know. Um, we have a fantastic episode for you guys today, as we always do. Uh, we had on an elected official, which, uh, you know, we tend not to like those people very much, but uh, there's a few good ones. And so we had uh, one of them today, uh, one from uh, one of my favorite states in the union, uh, the state of West Virginia. But before we get to all that, as always, go to AmericanMoment.org. Uh, there you can find everything we have cooking, including backlogs of this podcast, our features, Amcanon, our aggregation of 150 books, essays, podcasts, YouTube videos, short pieces, and more. You can find events that we have coming up. You can find um, all of the the weird and wonderful things we have cooking, my deranged media appearances across the United States. There's just a lot of great content. Highly recommend you do it. Join the mailing list. You won't regret it. We don't give uh, your email away to anyone else, unlike it appears every single other organization on the planet. Um, So we will not detonate your personal email if you happen to sign up with it. That is our guarantee um this week we had on a fantastic guest uh someone who's been a friend of ours for some time now someone that we are are very bullish on for the future we had on riley moore who is the state treasurer from west virginia now uh enterprising moment of truth completionists might think a riley from west virginia we've had one of those true we had on riley keaton who's from the house of delegates in west virginia several months ago but uh, there are in fact two based rileys from the state of west virginia uh riley moore is west virginia's 25th state treasurer the first republican elected in i think 90 years and he was elected in 2020 he was born in morgantown and he started his career as a welder and then eventually uh, was bullied into going to college uh got a degree in government and international politics was a hill staffer for a bit was in the private sector and then uh, ran for the house of delegates and now is the state treasurer and he's one of the most interesting statewide constitutional officers in the country uh, is actually doing something with the power that he's been given uh, we're big fans of the work that he's done and we had what i thought was a fantastic conversation what do you think nick yeah, you know, as a uh, actually, you know, I suppose I'll make the announcement here because we're recording this after we did the interview, but that way people know going into it. My wife and I just bought a house in West Virginia, so I am a uh, Riley constituent, uh, and so he spent the entire episode trying to earn my vote. No, I'm just <laughs> kidding. You know, it's 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 great for me to hear a lot more about the state that that uh, you know we're going to be raising our family in that we're uh, planning a flag in. Um, yeah, I, did you know that you'll have a full hope scholarship for your kids? I homeschool. No, I did not. <laughs> uh, I'm immediately Googling that after we're done. <laughs> Actually, no, I'm going to look it up on DuckDuckGo. I'm not, yeah. I do not use Google. Um, but, uh, but I'm going to look it up uh, after, after we record cause we will be homeschooling. Yeah. So it was a fantastic conversation. Um, very interesting, a rising star we think, and someone that, that all of you should be aware of. Uh, he's doing real interesting stuff and, uh, uh, has imagination unlike many people in American politics. So we'll go now to state treasurer Riley. Riley, thank you for coming on the podcast. Thank you for having me. Uh, this has been a long time coming. Uh, you're you're not that far away, but still, you know, far enough that uh, it's uh, you know been been some time since we decided we wanted to do this. But we're excited to have you on. Uh, you've got one of the most interesting backgrounds of any elected official that I'm aware of. Tell us that story. How'd you how'd you end up where you are today? Well, it's it's a long story. It's a good thing this is a long form program. <laughs> um, yeah. So I actually uh, started my career off as a welder. Um, I went to trade school, and uh, you know I have 
two sides to each coin of every person, right? I have part of my family is um, historically been welders and labor, and uh, the other side of my family is more political. And uh, for me, I didn't have any interest in politics at that point in, at all in my life, and uh, followed the path of uh, my mother's family, who, you know, for the most part, we, I mean, we're Irish Catholic union people and uh though i was not in the union so i went to trade school and uh became a certified welder um i was first started off working in a mining operation actually uh which was wonderful mm -hmm. uh it was one of the best work experiences of my life mm -hmm. uh, i still think about uh working there mm -hmm. uh, sometimes when i'm involved in this mm -hmm. um Worked at several different uh, places, uh, welding. Um, one of the last ones was uh, I was at a subcontractor uh, for the military. We were making military parts and components. I got to make some, uh, like these machine gun turrets that were sitting on fast boats for like 50 cals yeah. and some other kind of parts and components, torpedo clamps. We were seeing, seeing those. Mm -hmm. um, Oh, yeah. And then the arms that raise the door, like the uh, blast doors on the back of an aircraft carrier. Mm -hmm. So the arms that did that, uh, I made those too. And I remember that because I literally got my finger crushed uh, making one of them and they had to repair my pinky. It had oh, my goodness. Taking the flesh completely down to the bone off of it. But uh, it was a great experience nonetheless, though. And then I ended up going to college. I was getting berated by some of my family members. Why don't you try it out? I did. I welded through college and uh, went to George Mason University, uh, drove down there for school and still working. And I was in school for 9-11. And like a lot of other people at the time were inspired to get involved in public service or government in one facet or another. And um, started off as a contractor at Homeland Security. And then I said, well, you know, I, I ran into some people that worked at the Hill. Uh, it seemed like an interesting place. And uh, that's where all the decisions seem to be getting made at that time. Um, though it doesn't seem like anything happens there now. No. <laughs> um, so I went uh, to the Hill. How I got there is really funny because I wanted to be on the House Foreign Affairs Committee. I figured out the staff director for the House Foreign Affairs Committee, the International Relations Committee at the time was Henry Hyde, uh, famed of the Hyde Amendment, uh, big pro-life guy. And um, Tom Mooney, the staff director, owned Murphy's Irish Pub in Alexandria. And I'm like, I'm going to go get a job there. And so I got a job <laughs> there and was like, look, please just give me a shot. Uh, let me work on the committee. He said, all right, but you're still working at this bar. So I had to work there. Uh, you know, a lot of sleepless nights because uh, I was working at night, working during the day, but it was a great experience. Ended up going through the um, committee ranks. Um, I was uh, former, uh, a uh, professional staff member on the committee and uh, national security staff for people who don't know what that is. I'm sure people listening to this probably do. But uh, And then I went out to the private sector and I was working for uh, Defense companies ended with Textron, and I was really unfulfilled by it. I was unsatisfied. Um, you know, it, it just wasn't. It just wasn't scratching my itch, mm -hmm. and and I felt like I had a, a different purpose. And you know, you ever been in a situation where you look around and you're like, "Am I in the right place?" And that's kind of what it felt like for me. And so then I ended up running for the House of Delegates. And then in that crazy two years, uh, in my first term in, in the House of Delegates, we actually impeached our entire Supreme Court. Wow. And the Speaker of the House at the time moved into the Supreme Court, got appointed by the governor, so we had a speaker's race. And it was me as a freshman and a sophomore uh, delegate, now Speaker Hanshaw, ran uh, for uh, majority leader speaker and I ran for majority leader and we won and so I was in my second year been named the majority leader and then I ended up going on to uh, run for state treasurer the incumbent had won by six and a half points uh, I'd saw a lot of bad things in that office lack of transparency uh, what I viewed as a lot of corruption that was going on there and he had been in for 24 years 
and we had two statewide Democrats left at the time, uh, and he was one of them. And uh, I ran against him in 2020, un- unseated the 24-year incumbent, and became the first Republican state treasurer elected in 92 years in West Virginia. And won by 100,000 votes, 13 points. We had a very uh, big win there. We were really happy. And ever since I've got in there, uh, we've been working very, very hard to push back against what we believe is this ESG uh, woke capitalism nonsense that's going on in this country, which right out of the gate, I had people approach me about coal operators and gas operators as well. Yeah. Boy, there's so much there, but I do want to zoom back to uh, when you were a welder. Um, you know, I feel like a long time ago on this podcast, someone actually asked a question about this. They said, one of the things that people in D.C. who have the politics that we do uh, may accidentally do is is romanticize blue-collar labor. Blue-collar labor is hard, and there's mm-hmm. a reason why parents who do it want their kids to go on and do white collar labor or something, or you know, at least in a lot of cases they do. Right. Well, what, what is it that you think the public perception of what it's like to work in those sorts of jobs gets wrong? Um, what would caution be to people on the right who may romanticize those jobs? Um, uh, it sounds like you really enjoyed it, but, but what's the, what's the full picture there? Well, I, I, I did enjoy it. And one of the things I highlighted though, you are going to get hurt. Mm-hmm. People get hurt in these jobs. I got hurt um, I mean, we had people die uh, in the mining operation I was in. That does happen. Mm-hmm. Um, these are dangerous jobs. Um, many times uh, they don't come with health care. Mm-hmm. Um, so people with families, that can be difficult. Um, and it's, you know, <sighs> the connectivity that you have with your colleagues because you're working in dangerous environments. Um, are so much different than it is in the type of position I'm in now, mm-hmm. uh, like a white collar job. Um, you know, I'm trusting them with my life. If, if there is a load that they're bringing down off of a crane or uh, into a rock crusher or something like that, which I used to have to fix and get inside of, if they're not doing that correctly, I could get killed. And so there's a there's a different connectivity there that I think is great, um, but. Uh, to that point, it's, it is hugely important to this country. I think blue collar work, I think we need to continue to incentivize it. Uh, and I think we need to push it, but I think we need to be clear about what it is and the longevity of it as well for some people, uh, mm-hmm. because as you get older, it does become more difficult. Now, the innovations in technology have made the longevity in those types of jobs better. Um, and it's one of the reasons, you know, I came up with this program that we've started in West Virginia, the Jumpstart Savings Account, because the newer the tools that you have, generally the safer uh, you are. But there is a there is a safety concern there. There always is. Um, you know, I got electrocuted a few times welding. I mean, that's going to happen. Um, and, uh, you know, the the healthcare aspect of it, that that's not always there. That's always can that that can be a concern. But you know that going into that job. And um, for some people, that's acceptable. Go out and buy something on the market. For others, they might join a labor union or something like that. But um, it, it is great work, though. There's something that's so wonderful about being able to have a finished product that is tangible, that you can look at and you can put your hands on. This kind of work, you're never done. There's, mm-hmm. you know, you're never wrapping a bow on it and it's like, all right, I did it and I've solved all the problems. I yeah. Mean, it, it, it's consistent here. Yeah. So coming from, uh, you know, a blue collar job, uh, there's a lot of hullabaloo these days about, you know, the, the Republican party's turn towards this like blue collar conservatism. Um, how are the types of people that you are working with, your coworkers, the people that you know in West Virginia, um, how are they kind of reacting to this to this new moment to a lot of the policies that President Trump f- put forward um, that elected officials like yourself are putting forward? Well, it was met ecstatically, uh, particularly with President Trump. Uh, finally, there was somebody who was speaking our language, um, somebody who is culturally conservative, but also understands that we should not be shipping all our jobs to China. We should not be allowing them to jump, dump cheap steel into this country and crush our industries. We were 
at one point a huge steel state. We still manufacture steel, but nowhere to the degree that we used to. And we finally had somebody that was speaking to us, which is why you saw Trump win a state like West Virginia by nearly 70% each election cycle. Um, and, you know, these global supply chains that had just crushed our small towns and things like that. Um, someone was finally talking about that and seeing us and what we were going through and what we've been suffering from now for decades. And so you've seen this rapid transition of Democrats, uh, union or non-union alike, um, to the Republican uh, side as it relates to electoral politics in West Virginia. And I think everybody's kind of grappling with how do we relate with them, right? How do we have that conversation? Obviously, we're in alignment on some things. We're not in alignment on everything, obviously. Um, but it's, it's an evolving conversation. The voters are there. The organizations, the unions themselves, are quite a bit behind uh, where their membership is and where they see us. But I'll give you a great example, like this um, ESG fight that we're, under, uh, that we're undertaking here uh, in my office. I got thousands of letters from pipeliners, um, uh, local pipeliners union, in support of what I'm doing. And I called them up and said, you know, thank you so much for this support. And they're like, well, you know, you're one of the first Republicans we've ever written a letter to ever. Mm. Um, and, and I think this party right now, I think, is the party of the working class. I think this is the party of the blue collar worker. And I think this is a path forward that will see us in a majority that will be unbreakable uh, for a long time to come if that is the direction this party goes and which is the direction it should go. In just a short period of time, uh, you know, just since 2020, you've actually done things with your office. Um, one of the elements that I want to dive into is that Jumpstart program you mentioned for, for blue collar uh, workers and tradesmen. Uh, tell us a little bit about it. Why did you have the idea for it? What's the problem you're trying to solve and, and what's the reception been? Yeah, this is a really exciting program is Jumpstart Savings Program is the first of its kind in the country. It doesn't exist anywhere else. So obviously most of us are familiar with the 529 college savings accounts. Mm -hmm. This is similar to that, but this is not for trade school. It's not for education. This savings account is for after graduation to be able to buy tools, equipment, licenses, certifications, and new business startup costs. Now, the idea seems like, wow, why didn't I think of that? Um, for me, it came from myself being a welder. And at one time, I wanted to start my own mobile welding business. I wanted to go to different mining operations and maintenance the mining equipment it was very cost prohibitive and I didn't end up going down that road. I'd probably be making more money now had I done that <laughs> than state treasurer. Yeah. But um, that's how I came up with it. I'm like, how can we help people that are going into the trades and vocations? What can we do? And one of the biggest barriers, you got to think, you come out of college, you have your piece of paper, you got the degree, you have the knowledge, uh, maybe you even bought a computer with a 529 college savings account, your books and all that. If you're an auto mechanic and you come out of auto mechanic school, you have to buy thousands of dollars worth of tools. A vehicle, for instance, uh, to, you have to get to different job sites. That's a huge deal. People sometimes can't continue to work because they can't, especially in a rural state like West Virginia, we don't have public transportation, mm -hmm. right? So a vehicle is so necessary uh, for them to be able to continue their work. So they can start these accounts anytime they are in uh, trade school. And they can even start them uh, before 18 years old. They can start them as a little kid. And the program works like a 529. Now, it is somewhat different that you could move the money in and out very quickly. So you can take a $25,000 deduction on your income taxes, maximum dollars put into the savings account. Then as the money goes out, you can take another $25,000 deduction annually on each side. Then you have the capital gains. So you won't pay capital gains tax in the state of West Virginia as the money grows. And we have investment options for that, just like a 529 account. And this is to get people incentivized to get into these jobs because, you know, you got folks coming out with $100,000, $200,000 in debt 
uh, with a degree in Russian literature or, you know, strategic communications or whatever the hell they're giving degrees away for these days, as long as you're willing to pay, it seems like they'll come up with something. This is something where you can, in a state like West Virginia, where community college is free, obviously union apprenticeships are free, and they can come out debt-free, money saved, and be ready to go to work. And that's what we need to do in this country. And I'm very hopeful that this is something that catches on nationwide. But it the program actually rolls out July 1st of this year. So we're just uh, getting pretty close here on it right now. So July 1, it rolls out, which uh, is actually my birthday. So <laughs> I'm really excited about it. Uh-huh. And we're, uh, it's open to everybody. If you're right to work, you can use it. Trade unions can use it as well. Um, it was actually endorsed by the trade unions in West Virginia and the Chamber of Commerce. I don't remember any time the two of those coming <laughs> together on anything. Yeah. Um, so it, it, I think it's just a huge win-win. And it's a way as a party, um, as an elected official, we can say, here's how we should be dealing with blue collar workers instead of trying to jam them into this Stuff Biden's talking about, well, we'll teach coal miners and everybody else how to uh, code and all that. They don't want to code. They went to school for a reason. They don't want to learn how to code. We need to, the same way that we have all these freebies and giveaways for college, we need to be doing more to incentivize uh, the trades and vocations in uh, in the United States. Yeah, that's it, it makes all the sense in the world when you lay it out like that. And, and just in terms of the balance, right? It's, there's all of the incentives in public policy are geared towards pushing people towards more and more and more higher education, which I think there should be significantly less of that. But that's besides the point, even if you think that that's well and fine, being pluralistic would mean saying, well, maybe there's people who don't want to do that, who can earn a great living. And why don't we incentivize that in a very similar way? And you know, that this is by no means an extreme program. It's just encouraging saving with an eye towards something productive for their future career prospects. Um, what what kind of jobs specifically do, do you have in mind and does the program have in mind that people will use it for welders, miners? Like who, who what kinds of people? Is it, it, it really runs the gamut. It's, yeah. it, we kept it very broad. So you could go to beautician school. Mm -hmm. Uh, Not that I think you're going to beautician school, but maybe (laughs) you could, but you could. But if you went to beautician school, you could start one of these accounts. You know, they need to buy chairs and scissors and clippers and combs. I don't know. You know, uh, those, those types. You are not a beautician. I am not a beautician, but but all the necessary equipment that they need they can buy it with that account. Uh, and then they could also use it if they wanted to save however long it took, 10, 20 years, um, save long-term to use the money to then start at that new small business as well. So it could be a beautician. It could be a welder. Mm-hmm. It could be an auto mechanic. Any type of vocation qualifies mm-hmm. uh, for this that is non-college related. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So Zoom up. tell us about the job that you hold. What What is a state treasurer? Not every state has one. Yeah, some of them call them different things. What what is the scope of the power that you have, and then we'll after that talk about some of the things you've done with that power. But but what exactly is that role? Yeah, so I'm the chief financial officer for the state of West Virginia, and uh, you're right, not every state has one. Most do. Uh, sometimes I call him a comptroller. Sometimes they call him a CFO. Um, most are called state treasurers. So as the chief financial officer for the state, uh, I manage our general revenue fund. Uh, I do the investments for that. Every payment that comes from the state of West Virginia comes from my office, whether it's paychecks or contractors or otherwise, every payment comes from my office. So I manage roughly about $8 billion in the consolidated fund. I have $13 billion in total in assets under management. Uh, at the state treasurer's office. And we have several different silos there. So we have our savings programs. I mentioned Jumpstart. We have 529. We have Hope Scholarship, which is our new educational savings account. We have the most broad ESA in the United States right now. It applies to homeschool, um, private school, all of it, uh, charter school, all the above, even uh, um, you know the at-home learning that uh, is so important for so many people in West Virginia. So we have that, and then we have uh, a 401k supplemental plan for uh, 457, West Virginia Ables for folks living with disabilities. We have unclaimed property. Um, if you have stale checks that don't get cash, those come over to me. I got about 300 million dollars in liabilities there. <laughs> 
Um, and so we try to get the, the money back to their rightful owners. Um, I'm a member of a lot of different boards, the Economic Development Board for the state, uh, the state pension. Uh, I'm on that board. And um, that's uh, kind of a pretty good broad overview of it, of kind of our big uh, programs. I talked about the consolidated fund that's silo there is cash management for us. And and then we help also manage the rainy day fund. So anything dealing with the finances of the state, that is me. I'm the money man. So most Republicans would look at this sort of job and be like, that <clears throat> looks great. I'm going to be a statewide elected official, get to deal with lots of money. Maybe I can do some some fiscally responsible things. Maybe I can, you know, make things slightly more efficient, run slightly better, but never going to have to do anything controversial, never going to have to do anything interesting. Uh, that isn't what you've chosen to do with your role. What what were you looking at as you knew that you were going to be moving to this role? Who was your inspiration? Were there any other state treasurers doing interesting stuff? What was your plan when you went in to actually use the office for something interesting? Well, first and foremost, I, as I mentioned previously, I needed to clean it up. Mm -hmm. um, we had a lot of fat that needed to be trimmed in that office. Uh, we needed to modernize the office. Uh, that hadn't been done in not only years, but perhaps decades mm -hmm. in terms of technology there. You're not like using QuickBooks or anything? Yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, for instance, I mean, we didn't have, uh, now you have new resident in West Virginia here. Yes. Um, you can pay all your taxes uh, for the county and all that online because we put a bill in that said, all right, every political subdivision, you got to have an online payment system. Still at a weird time of year, but it, it, it's is, a, it, it is it's a, weird at a good time of year. It, it's online now. So that's, <laughs> yeah, that's helpful. Previously, you didn't have that in most of the counties. You did not have that. So we were going through our modernization process, creating more transparency and accountability I handed back to legislature $15 million out of the gate and just waste. And then we cut our budget by 5% also right out of the gate because we knew we could do more with less. Then, uh, obviously, I was acutely aware of this ESG movement that had been going on in the country. Um, it had been around for a while. You know, it kind of started off with this um, uh, socially responsible investing back in the day, which was really a left to the agency of the individual. And then there were some products out there, financial products that they could invest in. Um, now we're in this era of coercive capitalism, uh, and which is really economic extortion, where they're coercing capital away from industries based on these arbitrary ESG scores, environmental social governance scores that they have come up with. And so it really came to a head very quickly in the first few months. I had coal operators and gas companies come to me and say, we were losing access to capital. We cannot continue to produce if these banks cut us off. And they're going to cut us off because we're a gas company. And we do natural gas or we're a coal company. And coal's right at the top of their priority list, which would be massively um, detrimental to the state of West Virginia. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, we collect hundreds of millions of dollars in tax revenue in severance taxes alone. That's every time a coal a ton or a ton of coal is uh, mined, uh, they pay a tax on it. Uh, same thing with, with gas, uh, their metric ton. So, and so this is an existential threat to our economy and existential threat to our uh, budget and the state of West Virginia. And I was determined because look, I've traveled all over this state. We have people in this state that if you take away that coal mining job, they're left in many places with one opportunity and that's working at Walmart. I mean, that is not living. That's not, I mean, our coal miners make an average of $90,000 a year right now. And why did that happen? Well, because it's the same globalists that showed up and said, no, look, Walmarts are going to come in. We're going to have these global supply chains. You get all your goods and services cheaper. It'll be fine. Hollowed out our entire downtowns, crushed us. Mm -hmm. And now we got these same global elites have come back and said, you need to uh, stop coal mining because it's terrible for the world, uh, even though it powers this country and uh, the majority of the world. 
And so then you're left working at Walmart. I mean, it, it, for us, it feels like we're essentially indentured to these people. Mm-hmm. And for me and my background, there was no way I was going to allow that to happen. So we started looking at, okay, what financial institutions are we doing business with? Who are we doing business with? And what we came to find was many of them were, in my definition, boycotting the fossil fuel industry. And we put in a bill in the state legislature, and we said, if you're boycotting the fossil fuel industry, you will lose the ability to bid on any contract with the state of West Virginia, which is, for example, an ACH contract. We do $20 billion in transactions a year. Um, we have a cash management contract, about $4 billion. And not only that, I got a coalition of 15 other states to come together to also agree to reform their contracting process, either through legislation or through the um, uh, regulatory mechanisms within their office, their contracting mechanisms. And for us, we're just acting as a free market participant in this. We're stating our preferences in the marketplace. And if you want to do business with us, then you got to do business with our industries. If not, find another state. I'm sure California would love you. (laughs) Go on out there and do business with them. They got plenty of money, but you're not going to do business here. And so flash forward now, Bill is a law. And uh, we just sent letters out to six financial institutions just a couple weeks ago to let them know that they're going to be put on this denied financial institution list. And they they got 30 days to appeal. So we're looking forward to that. Well, and this is like common sense to to basically anybody like if these people hate you and everything that you're that you're you know state that my state now uh i suppose that's the announcement i just bought a house in in west virginia yeah um but uh if 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 these banks and these massive financial institutions hate your state hate the people that live in your state hate the people that the power your state and the rest of the country why why do business with them like that that seems like common sense to anybody um the very interesting thing to me here has been the complete pants wetting I've seen about <laughs> your measure everywhere. I actually haven't been on my 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 wife has been tweeting from my account for the last couple of weeks, so I haven't really been on Twitter. <laughs> but um, but I've been seeing a lot of articles about this. Everyone from the left saying, you know, wow, this you know super anti green anti environment guy uh, is destroying our world. To people on the right saying, oh well, that's not free market. Um, what have been some of the most like outrageous responses that you've gotten from? Well, from you just people? you just touched on one of them right now that this is not free market. Uh, I'm not a regulator. I'm a participant, and we're stating our preferences in the marketplace. Period. That's it. If you can't meet those preferences, then you're not going to contract with us. Two, uh, this idea in the New York Times wrote some article about me recently about this. You know, yeah, I read that this, one. <laughs> this is this guy's a huge threat to green energy and this and that. Green energy is a huge threat to the country. Three percent of the world uses three uh, percent of the world's electricity comes from wind turbines and solar panels. That's it. That is it. In 1980, 40 percent of the world was powered by coal. You know what that is today? It's still 40 percent. Mm. There is a requirement for coal out there. And, you know, what I am doing is you, you got to remember, we're going to have increased energy requirements, whether it's from electric cars or iPhones and this and all these things that take battery power. Now, we're going to have increased electrification requirements in this country and not only this country, in the world. We got some of the best natural resources. We are an energy superpower that is being suppressed by the left wing lunatics out here. Mm. And we should be able to export this coal, export this gas. I'll give you a great example. There is energy poverty in the world, which nobody talks about. And that's what these ESG woke capitalists are subjecting the rest of the world to is energy poverty. You have 3.3 billion people that are functioning on a thousand kilowatts or less a year, a thousand kilowatts can barely power a refrigerator for a year. Mm. I mean, that is awful. That's what they're subjecting all these folks to. And you go look at a country like India, great example. 75% of India's electricity comes from coal. India has had their air conditioning increase 13% every year. 
the amount of people that own air conditionings. Right now, only 5% of people in India own air conditionings. That's it. If it continues to increase 13% every year, just from air conditionings, India's uh, energy requirements are going to double every six years just to power air conditioning. Mm -hmm. So where are you going to get cheap, reliable, abundant energy? Baseload energy. That is coal, natural gas, and nuclear. Those are the only three that supply that. So coal is asking for no favors. We want mm -hmm. nothing. We just want to be left alone and be able to do business. Solar and wind, they can't function without our money, our tax credits going towards them and these tax giveaways. They're the ones that are the problem. I mean, look, it's if you're talking about something that's 3% of the entire world's electrical grid, Shouldn't it be like 3% of the conversation, mm. right? Like why, why, you know, we're so focused on this when we have new technology, carbon sequestration and things like that. End of the day, the United States is maybe 10% of the greenhouse gas emissions. Asia is roughly 70%. So we're going to destroy people's lives and potential for human flourishing here in the United States over 10% greenhouse gas emissions. How in the world does that make sense? And it doesn't. I mean, the, it, th mm -hmm. this is a problem uh, or this is a solution in search of a problem. The problem doesn't exist. We're doing this cleaner and better. We get the cleanest water and air in the world here in the United States. And it's because of the technological innovations that we've had around uh, energy extraction, uh, the extractive industries. So to me, you know, these folks saying I'm out here trying to destroy green energy. I'm not trying to destroy green energy. If you all want to put your money towards solar panels and wind turbines, good for you. I don't mm. care. Do whatever you want. So I want to give you an opportunity to talk about not just, you know, how coal production in the state of West Virginia helps America, helps the world. I want you to be able to talk about the, the, the people that you represent and how, you know, this move is going to benefit them. Um, I don't want you to have to, you know, put your, I'm sure you got a, uh, a great hand and I don't want you to have to put it all right. out on the table, but I think there are a lot of interesting things that have been done. Like Alaska as an example, they have their, uh, permanent fund dividend that they like pay out to, um, Alaska citizens on the, um, I believe it's the, the like profit on their investments from uh, oil revenues. Um, what other kinds of things benefiting West Virginians, this is not a self-interested question, <laughs> um, uh, are on the table as it relates to the the sorts of things that West Virginia produces for the benefit of the country? Yeah, I mean, obviously it's coal, obviously it's natural gas, but we have a shared benefit here too in, in West Virginia. I keep saying here like I'm in West Virginia, I'm always there. Um, Every county in West Virginia gets a piece of severance tax, even the county you're living in. Mm. Uh, everybody shares in the profits of the severance taxes that we collect. Every county gets that, and it helps fund the county commissions around the state of West Virginia. Our natural gas, um, I, I mean, to be clear, it, it is crazy the amount of restrictions that are on there in terms of extracting uh, this ocean that we're sitting under. The Marcellus footprint has now been declared the second largest gas field in the world. Wow. And Where is we, that? That is all of West Virginia into Pennsylvania and Ohio. Mm -hmm. And I think Virginia might touch a little bit, but that is the biggest footprint or second biggest footprint in the world. And we're maybe at 30% capacity. Now we can't get it out because pipelines, you go look up there, in, and this is the thing. West Virginia could share this energy wealth with the whole country, right? And you're asking, how can, how can it benefit everybody? Manufacturing, right? Manufacturers want cheap, reliable energy to lower their overhead costs, right? Go look at New England. Price of gas up there, natural gas, mm -hmm. is very expensive right now. Why? Because there's no pipelines that can get the gas up there. They've blocked every pipeline through these ESG measures that are out there. We got the Atlantic Coast Pipeline now shut down. That's done because of flying squirrels in Virginia. <laughs> I wish I was joking about that. It's real. Like actual flying squirrels. Actual flying squirrels. <laughs> that's that's where the court came down on the side of the flying squirrels. So um, sorry, everybody. Your power bill is going up. Yeah. Um, but that's what this could unlock. Look, 
energy security, we need to be energy independent in this country. We should not be relying on any foreign country or dictator out there for our energy requirements. We can do it all here. And if we were to do that, I mean, we could revitalize this country as a manufacturing hub for the world. And we used to be that. We used to be that. And I think we could get back to that. Now, you go look at some of these great manufacturing uh, hubs and cities in this country, which have now really a lot of times look like a war zone, burned out buildings, people addicted to drugs. But down at the bottom there, those kind of foundational stones still exist. And that's American energy. If we can just harness American energy, we can build that back up. You got the U.S. and Chinese economy obviously are decoupling. Everybody knows that. China's decoupling from us faster than we are them. How are we going to answer that problem? American energy is part of the way to do that. West Virginia could lead the way. Mm. So the vision you've laid out for West Virginia is very different than I think a lot of even well-meaning people in D.C. lay out a vision for West Virginia. We talked about this with uh, with the other great Riley from, from West Virginia. Yeah, he's a good ago. one. But but he said, you know, West Virginia doesn't need your pity. And that's that's what a lot of people in D.C., they think they're they're looking out for the interests of white working class voters in these states sound like. They're like, oh, you know, they're drug addicted. They're poor. We need to, we need to use policy to help them. That what you're talking about is proud vision. Uh, it's 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 one where you, there's no handout needed. It's it's it's. Just let the state do what it's already good at, as opposed to constantly, you know, peeing in its cornflakes. How are, how are you thinking about that vision, that posture for for West Virginia as one of its, you know, statewide constitutional officers? I mean, you hit the nail on the head. We just need people to get out of our way and let us do what we have been doing, and not have an administration who is trying to shut us down at every step of the way. And We've gone through this. You know, we had the war on coal with Obama. Now we're back with this ESG movement. I mean, it was somewhere in the ballpark of coal mining jobs and secondary and tertiary jobs related to coal. I mean, we almost lost, I think it was around 30,000 jobs. Wow. I mean, it was. And so people want Out wanna, of a population of two three million, million? Two, two million. million, yeah. And so, which we're less than two million now. Yeah. But- People want to know why we're drug addicted. Well, you have a bunch of people that tens of thousands of people that have lost their jobs who are now on government subsidies, which they don't want to be on. We don't have jobs in some of those areas because of this globalization push that's been going on for so long uh, in this country that, I mean, affected us tremendously in a negative way. And so, look, we have people in our state that want to work, but, you know, it's either you know, through fiat of financial corporations telling us what industries are good or bad, or we've had um, these massive drug companies uh, who've been pushing pills into our state uh, for a very long time. We've had some good settlements out of that, but settlements, I mean, that didn't, that didn't bring back people's lives. That didn't bring, bring us back the jobs that we had and the, uh, and the, uh, economic success we had had previously in the state. So all we want is to just to be able to flourish and succeed in the vision that we have. And we have been, you're a good example of it, been picking up population again in the state of West Virginia since the census came out. People see us obviously as a conservative state, a great place to live and raise a family. Uh, It's a very affordable place. And there's younger people that are seeing a lot of opportunity in West Virginia that are coming in there. We just had New Core Steel come into West Virginia, over $3 billion investment in West Virginia. That is obviously huge for us. We have some other um, that I can't mention because I'm on a board, but uh, <laughs> we're going to have some other really big developments coming into West Virginia here mm-hmm. shortly. And uh, I, I think people see the writing on the wall that, I mean, we just we can come back to what we wore and West Virginia is usually, I think a great barometer when you think about the rust belt and what has happened in this country, if we're succeeding places like Southern Ohio and uh, uh, Southwest Pennsylvania and all that, even all the way up to Detroit and all that, Mm -hmm. it's that used to be the whole corridor. You know, we'd mine the coal down South. We'd make the steel up North. We'd send it all the way up to Detroit to make the cars. I mean, this is how that, 
whole thing took place. We got to bring that back. Mm -hmm. We can do that again. And I, the thing that really bothers me is where folks think it's too far gone. It can't happen. We can't bring back the, we can't have nice things. <laughs> yeah. We can't have nice things. Right. Um, so it's, you know, it, everybody has some, you know, woe is West Virginia. We are fine. We don't need your pity. Uh, we just need you to stay out of our way. Yeah. That's all we need. Tell me what politically, what is a median West Virginian like? What do they care about? I mean, how does a state elect Joe Manchin by the margins they do and Donald Trump by the margins they do? How do they elect you and Riley Keaton, but also, you know, uh, not not necessarily give a rubber stamp to any Republican who shows shows up? I mean, it's there's a very particular political character to it. What, what is it that, that West Virginia voters want? Because I think it's a, it's a great example for what a lot of you know, the, the, the voters that president Trump picked up want and, and what the future of the Republican party could look like. You know, as I mentioned with president Trump, he really spoke to the people of West Virginia and, you know, he's obviously at an atmospheric level running for president and being president, but somebody like Joe Manchin, uh, or some of the other elected officials here in the state, we are a small state and everybody kind of knows everyone. And, they want to know that you're going to get in office and you're going to fight for them. They're tired of politicians talking. We've heard politicians talk for a long time about how they're going to fix us. They want people doing things. And being a West Virginian and getting to this office, that's what I innately knew. And somebody at one point that wasn't very interested in politics, it's like, how can they let this happen to us? What are they doing to stop this? Mm -hmm. And so being active and doing something uh, goes a very long way. But secondarily, it's standing up against no matter who they are, whether they're corporate interests or otherwise, standing up against the people that do not have our best interest in mind, whether they are corporations or big banks. I'm sure as you can imagine, it's not always the most popular thing as a Republican to be against banks. Hmm. Uh, you know, I, I, I hear... A lot of that. Now, I will point out there's not one bank in West Virginia, headquartered in West Virginia, uh, that is boycotting the fossil fuel industry, obviously. It's your big national banks that are undertaking this. But it's just, it's, you know, we always feel like we're David and Goliath, you know. But um, you got to remember, David won. So, <laughs> uh, and they want somebody that feels like they can go out and win for them. It's also this, we are a blue-collar state. Mm -hmm. Only 25% of our population has a college degree. 75% does not. So well that's closer to the rest of the country than than not, right? I think it's right. it's only just over 30% of the country has a bachelor's degree or higher. So right. West Virginia is closer to the median American than, you know, the Massachusetts suburbs are. So Right. And what and what has that gotten us in yeah. West Virginia? People getting college degrees and leaving. Mm -hmm. We don't want them to leave. We want them to stay here, raise a family and start a business. That's what we want. That's obviously why this jump start thing is so important. So mm -hmm. Being just historically such a blue collar state, they want people that are sticking up for them and their values. We're a very culturally conservative state, obviously, extremely culturally conservative state. And, you know, you'll see the elected officials that we have generally reflect uh, those issues, whether you're state treasurer or your secretary of state, they want to know where you stand on guns, where do you stand on life, uh, where do you stand on this transgender sports issue, uh, all this other crazy stuff that's out there. Mm -hmm. And we are a very religious state. Um, always been our church attendance is extraordinarily high uh, mm -hmm. in West Virginia. And that ties into the fabric of the state. Uh, we are very diverse as it relates to our um, uh, topography, but then also um, our economies because you have little economic uh, hubs all over the state northern panhandle weirton west virginia is 30 minutes from pittsburgh very yeah. close then we got part of the state borders kentucky right now we got part of the other state borders maryland and virginia very different but what is all similar is they are either involved many uh in uh, blue collar work or they come from a background of it and even if they don't they innately understand it because that's the culture of mm -hmm. the state and then also the just religious values that we hold in the state and you know, it's kind of bifurcated. You know, you get more Catholics up north, you got more Protestants down south. But uh, 
also hold the exact same values like on life, for instance, um, yeah. which is hugely important in the state of West Virginia. Yeah, that's that's all fascinating. I mean, the, you think about what the center of gravity in the Republican Party was in the early 2010s. It was you know, fiscally conservative, socially liberal. It doesn't sound like that's that's where West Virginians are. We're, we're using that framework, you know, fiscally X, socially Y. Where, where would you say they are? You know, look, do West Virginians want waste and abuse in government? And like, you know, they don't want government waste as much as anybody else. It's their money. But look, we are obviously a socially conservative state, extremely con socially conservative. Um, in terms of fiscally conservative, yes, they don't want waste and things like that, but they also want roads built. Mm -hmm. They also want state government to do things to make it a better place to live, work, and raise a family. Um, so in a, for us, it's <clears throat> we're kind of conservative, certainly across the board, but understand that especially a state like West Virginia has so many highways and things like that, mm -hmm. the government does have a role to play uh, there. And, you know, the idea of just being fiscally conservative and then socially liberal, mm -hmm. that's not where we are. Mm -hmm. That is not where West Virginia yeah. is. Final question, Riley. What has been some of the craziest stuff that either people who say they're on the right or these corporations and banks themselves have started doing against you because of the activity that you've been engaged in? Well, you know, other than writing all these uh, bad articles, which are actually great articles for yeah. me, but like the New York Times one, nobody even saw in West Virginia because yeah. no one has a subscription to New York Times. Yeah. But, <laughs> um, you know, which is actually makes me stronger. It's the same way you see them sometimes attack Mansion, and then it just makes him stronger mm -hmm. as well uh, at times. But uh, yeah, where I've had people say what I'm doing is unconstitutional. Uh, what I am doing as it relates to the ESG movement um, is uh, illegal, unconstitutional. Um, I am putting my Make thumb Milton on and Friedman cry. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm putting my thumb on the scale as a market regulator, which I am obviously not, as I've stated many times. And, you know, this is, as you mentioned, the 2010s and even going back further, you know, to somebody like Bush, right. They just took it on the chin. Mm -hmm. I mean, just over and over again. And it's, that's not what we're doing here. We're going to fight mm -hmm. and, you know, we're going to see where this whole thing ends up. But those are some of the criticisms that, you know, I just kind of brush aside. And, you know, I know I'm on the right side of this with my state and uh, the country, frankly, with the coalition that we're leading to push back against this and get capital, our, our capital, away from these people that are trying to destroy our industries and our way of life. But, um, yeah, it, it's, it's interesting. And then I get op-eds dropped all the time in random newspapers in West Virginia saying same type of arguments yeah. on BlackRock paying some PR firm. Yeah. I, I, some people I, yeah. have never been to West Virginia. Yeah. 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 Well, and that was one of the other big things, obviously, we did. We dropped BlackRock as one of our investments, uh, investment funds uh, at, uh, at our Board of Treasury investments for the state of West Virginia, which ended up causing a bunch of waves. Um, and then, you know, we kind of did a little media tour around that. And um, I'm hoping more states do it. Yeah, I'm hoping more states do the exact same thing because BlackRock does not have our interest in mind. Larry Fink has said it very clearly. Uh, capitalism has the power to shape society. And what that says to me, and it sounds like oh, I'm a Republican, maybe I should like that. Capital, lots of money has the power to shape society. Now, what if we don't want the same shape of society as Larry Fink does? And we don't even get a vote in it. And they control all these proxy votes all over the place and all these boards. So we got to make a clear decision here, I think, as a party. Are we going to live in like some corporate oligarchy or are we going to live in a democratic constitutional republic where we get to make the decisions at the ballot box? Obviously, I believe the latter. And I think if we don't do something to push back and reset that, I think it's going to be the former. Riley, where can people keep an eye on everything you're doing? I feel like just by watching national news, they're going to learn about you because it's making national news. But if they want to take a closer look, how can people follow you? Yeah, so uh, more for WV.com. I got all my little links there, Twitter, and even got an Instagram, Facebook, and all that. I'm on Twitter a lot. Uh, Riley Moore, uh, WV, my handle on there. Uh, we're constantly kind of putting stuff out. But I can tell you, look, we're just getting going on this. 
And uh, yeah, I mean, it's been less than two years and look at everything you've done. I mean, it's yeah. exciting to think what else you could get done. Oh, we're going to do a lot more. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure you're going to be hearing a, a quite a bit more about this because our bill actually passed in Kentucky, passed in Tennessee, passed in Oklahoma. Texas has their own bill. <clears throat> 13 states ran it in the last legislative session. We think we're going to see 20 states run it in the next one. So, And how many billions in capital is that? Well, with our 15 states, it was $600 billion in assets under management. Uh, then we got Alaska and I think Pennsylvania. We're talking about looking at this. Then we're looking at more. We're getting closer to a trillion. That'll put a dent. That'll put a dent. That'll put a dent. That'll put a dent. And so any of your listeners and viewers out there, go take a look at your 401k and your pension. I'm, you will find out that you are likely in some ESG fund. Um, talk to your asset manager because tell them you want out of it because there are other options. And last thing I'll say, those ESG ETFs, the administrative fees on those are double what a large cap S&P 500 ETF is. You are paying for this little social experiment. Don't take it. That ties a bow on it. Riley, thank you for coming on the podcast. Oh, thank you for having me. Told you guys that that would be an interesting episode. I feel like we really ended on a bang too. I mean, Riley is just, he actually cares. I mean, the first time I ever met Riley, we actually just like ran into each other at NatCon 2. Um, I guess a small announcement, I am apparently on the conference committee for NatCon 3. So if you have ideas for what National Conservatism Conference 3 should look like, uh, feel free to text me or email me. I mean, 90% of the listeners of this podcast are buddies of mine anyway, so you probably have my cell. Um, should, I, should I send my cell phone number on the no, podcast? No, should I should not, not do that. that. <laughs> should not do that. Um, Your email's enough. Yeah. Um, but feel free to reach out if you have any ideas for, for National Conservatism Conference 3. But uh, we just, we met there and we hit it off. We talked for like hours and I'm a big fan at conferences, events, uh, of finding someone who I actually want to talk to and talking to them for multiple hours as opposed to going around having 50 superficial conversations about the weather or what people are wearing. And so uh, Riley is that guy for me. Uh, we were we were at a Heritage Resource Bank recently and did the same thing. We we're just standing in the corner being slightly misanthropic and not talking to anyone else. It was great. I'm a big fan. Um, so thank you to him for taking time out of his busy schedule when he's up in D.C. to um, meet with us and then to, to tape the show. Um, as when always, are, when are you moving to West Virginia? When I uh, have uh, less work to do here in the District of okay. Columbia, yeah, not not all of us can you know have an email job. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, it's my job to actually you know uh, see people um, in person. Um, oh. So one day, hopefully, um, I would love to to move out there. It's a beautiful state. Um, I'll be visiting you on the weekend. That's it's true. Great. I'm gonna build a you know like doghouse for me. Yeah, I was, I, yeah, you read my mind. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, it's fine. I can cook. I can clean. Um, you know, I'm happy to. We're building you a servant's quarters in the yeah, backyard. Yeah, exactly. Uh, um, look, uh, you know, Evie often jokes that uh, she's second fiddle to, to Nick's real wife, which is me at work. Um, on the weekends, she can be first fiddle and I can be second fiddle. Yeah. Um, sounds less weird than it actually is, I promise. Uh, we just have long hours in the office. Anyway, go to AmericanMoment.org. Check out everything we're doing. Uh, rate and review the podcast five stars. Uh, it really does help us in the rankings. I know I say that generically every week, but it, it's true, I promise. Um, I we like to see the nice things that yeah. you say about us. Yeah, someone had a super long, detailed, kind uh, review the other day um, and where they said, like, this passes the grocery test where your mind never wanders when you listen to it and everything. And then uh, the next review was, I like podcast. <laughs> so you, you, can, you can, th there are many genders when it comes to how to go about reviewing this. You can do three extremely erudite paragraphs that make me damn near tear up or you can say i like podcast <laughs> all are welcome here on moment of truth anyway we'll see you guys next week thank you as always for listening moment of truth is an american moment studios production filmed at the conservative partnership center our podcast is produced and edited by jake mercier and jared cummings our intro music is A Minor Struggle by Ryan Serenich. Don't forget to like and subscribe on all platforms, and you can go to AmericanMoment.org to learn more.